that okay? All right. Man, it, I, I really hope. That song gets me, man, every time. And uh, in, in my mind, because I, I, I hear the music, and, uh, and I, I hope that one day uh, Sister Joy gets to sing that with an orchestra. Yeah. And, man, wouldn't it be great if right during the middle of that thing, all of a sudden the rapture took place? Yeah. And we just went up. Man, why'd you do that, brother? <laughs> where's, the, where's the Korean tissue? <laughs> oh. <laughs> now I gotta do this American style. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, well, I, I really hope that you get something from it uh, here this morning. It is, uh, it is, and I'll try to, I, I, I'll pray, ask the Lord to help me control the emotions here. Uh, that just, man, that really got me fired up. So uh, I'm, uh, take your Bible and go to the book of Ruth. Go to the book of Ruth. And I, I don't have a, a really good title uh, this morning. I'm just going to call it Lessons from Ruth. And so uh, we're going to look at the different characters in Ruth, and I really hope it'll help you. Okay, my Father, I thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the privilege of being able to preach this book here to these people. And I thank you, Lord, that we can be here on the mountain. And uh, Father, I ask that your word would be what it needs to be to us today. Uh, if it needs to be a mirror, let it be a mirror and show us what we're really like. Father, if it needs to be a fire and warm somebody up or just put a fire on them, get them doing something, let it do that. Father, if it needs to be a hammer, let it chip away at things. Father, if somebody needs to eat this morning, feed them with meat or... With, uh, with, uh, with some uh, honey or with some apples, Lord. Or maybe it needs to be some water. We got some thirsty souls or we got some parched ground, Lord. Or maybe, Lord, there's someone in here that's lost and I pray that their heart would be right and ready and that the seed of the Word of God would go in there and plant in there in order they would believe what they hear. Now, Father, we love you so very much and we do thank you for this privilege. Please fill me with the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, put my flesh down. Uh, these people did not come to hear from me. So I ask that you would increase Jesus Christ and decrease Josh Stevenson. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, so this is during the book of Judges, that there, or the time frame of the book of Judges, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died, also both of them, and the women... And, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So I'm going to talk about the, uh, the story of uh, Ruth here this morning. I like Bible stories, and uh, I think if you... Uh, we, we enjoy the, the deep things of God. You need to uh, get those things. But uh, you also need to know the, the milk of the word. You need to know the Bible stories. You need to know who guys like Jephthah was. You need to know who Gideon was. Um, Dr. Uckman even told us, uh, using scripture, of course, over in Hebrews chapter 13, that, that uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't benefit the people when, when they're occupied in strong meat. And it's better that the heart be established with grace and not with meat. And so we, we enjoy the meat, and you do need the meat. And so there's got to be a balance, because I come from uh, an upbringing where uh, meat of the Word of God was frowned upon, and it showed in the fruit that that church produced. Uh, but you need both. You need them both. And so we're going to learn some things about Ruth uh, here today. And so the first uh, character that we see in the passage is a woman by the name of Naomi. So the first thing I want to point out by way of my first point, in case we are uh, playing uh, Zub. Zonk, 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 play, play zonk, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is notice, 
sorry, is notice a hurt creature, a hurt creature. And uh, let's talk about Naomi here. Now, Naomi, there she is with her family. She's got uh, her husband, Elimelech. And then I don't know how you pronounce the names. I just call them Malon and Chilion because that's just how I've always pronounced it. And, and there they are. They're in Bethlehem. Now, uh, Bethlehem, Judah. Now, of course, if you've got Doc's notes there, you know he says that Bethlehem means house of bread and Judah means praising God. And so there's a famine in the land, so things are drying up, so they decide that they need to leave and they need to head on over to Moab and get away from the house of bread and get away from praising God and go somewhere else. And so the first thing I want to point out with this hurt creature is notice the search for a better life, the search for a better life. Here they are, and they decide to go find something, and the reason they're trying to go find something is because they're hungry. It's a fleshly reason to go, to go. they are making their decisions based off of fleshly reasons. It is a bad choice to make decisions off of fleshly reasons, and that's what they end up doing here. And uh, they, 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 uh, the, the, here they are in Bethlehem, the, the area that Bethlehem is, it just, maybe it was, it just, it, it wasn't enough. Uh, the praising God, Bethlehem, it just wasn't enough. They, they wanted something else. They figured that there was something better, so they decided to go to Moab. Now, uh, just real quick, if you could take your Bible and, and hold your place in Ruth and go to Acts chapter 17, um, it's going to seem like I'm rabbit trailing, but I'm not. In Acts chapter 17, I want you to notice about boundaries. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds. Notice the word bounds. The bounds of their habitation. So the Lord set up bounds of their habitation, of the people's habitation. Why? For the purpose that's found in the next verse, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So the Lord set up the bounds for the purpose of verse 27, that they would happily seek after, that, uh, that if haply they might feel after him. Uh, now, there, the Bible tells us, and uh, of course, uh, you, you most probably know this, in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8, the Lord sets up 12 boundaries. They're based off of uh, the tribes of Israel. All right, so there's 12 boundaries. I don't know what those boundaries are or where they physically are, but the Lord set up 12. So it's, it's more than just one. There's multiple. There's 12 of them. Uh, now, the devil's job, since the Lord sets something up, the devil's job is to remove boundaries. So take your Bible and go to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. So the devil's job is to remove boundaries. Isaiah 10. And I'm going to make a spiritual application. Isaiah chapter 10. And uh, uh, look at the context, o Assyr verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff, of the, uh, a staff in their hand is mine indignation. Uh, so I believe if I got this right, the context is uh, talking prophetically about the devil or the Antichrist. And then you move down to around verse 13, and this is the king of the Assyrian talking, and he says, For he saith, by my strength, this is not the Lord talking, this is the devil talking, for, by, for he saith, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom. Remember, the Bible says about uh, the devil that, oh, thou art wiser than Daniel. For, and he says, for I am prudent, and then watch what he says, for I have removed the bounds of the people. The devil's job is to remove the bounds. Now, 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 now look, I, I got this from other Bible believers, and, and maybe I'm not hearing it right, but I believe that the reason why we're seeing such a push for dropping all the national boundaries and, like, opening up the borders is because one day there has to be a one-world government, and everybody has to be able to all be together. So the devil's job is to tear down the boundaries. And if you think it just happens to do with physical boundaries, you are absolutely wrong. You know what you have here today? You have boundaries. You have boundaries of that King James Bible. Don't get away from that King James Bible. You have boundaries of a good Christian home. Don't try to get away from that Christian home. You know what you're doing, young people? You're going out there and you're thinking you're going to find something better, but you're not going to find anything better. People keep pushing against the boundaries. They don't like the music. I hate singing those old-fashioned hymns. I like the old-fashioned hymns. Leave my hymns alone. There's boundaries. You know what the Bible says where well, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's been a lot of liberty in this camp here. But there's also boundaries. You ought to learn to put boundaries on yourself, just like you were told, right? Yeah. All right, the devil's job is to tear down the boundaries. And they wanted to find themselves a better place to live, so they're in search of a better life. 
And so they head out looking. Where they were is too much constraint. It's the house of bread. It's praising God. This is too much constraint for some of you. You just cannot wait to get out of here. But I'm telling you, man, you're not going to find anything better. This is a blessing right here. You don't get this all the time. When's the last time you walked into a public school and saw a bunch of guys sitting over there looking over the Bible and talking about? You don't see that kind of stuff. Not very often. Not very often. All right. Now notice the sorrow from a bitter loss. So uh, they end up gone. So what happens is, is Naomi and her family, they go down there uh, to, uh, to Moab. And uh, Dr. Ruckman says that he believes that Naomi was the kind of like the, uh, the deciding factor on it. And I kinda, I'm in agreement with him because Dr. Ruckman, but also because... <laughs> <laughs> Also, because, because if you continue to look, when Elimelech dies, she doesn't leave. And she ends up marrying off her two boys, and they stay there for 10 more years. And then the boys die, and she doesn't go back until she hears there's, bre there's bread. And so a lot of times, ladies, you don't realize the influence you have in your home. And where's your heart, ladies? Is your heart desiring to go out there? Is your heart desiring to get away from the house of bread and get away from praising God? You don't realize the influence and the impact that a good woman can have in her home. Uh, and if you've got a good wife or you've got a good mother, thank God for them. Notice the sorrow from a bitter loss. Well, they goes ahead and she, uh, she finally heads back uh, to where she, uh, back to Bethlehem, Judah. And if you look at, in verse 20, it says, and she said unto them, so she went back to Bethlehem, Judah. They heard that Naomi was coming. They said, it is Naomi. And uh, that's what they said in verse 19. And verse 20, it says, and she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. This woman's pretty bitter. She comes back, it's, a, it's, it's sorrow from a bitter loss. She lost her, she lost her husband. She lost her two sons. She lost one daughter-in-law who decided to go back. And she comes back and she's just bitter. She's bitter. And, and, but then notice what she says in verse 21. And verse 21 has always confounded me. I've always found it very interesting. Here's what she said. I went out full. What? <laughs> then, then why did verse 1 happen? Why verse 1? I went out full. I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her. So Naomi, Naomi goes out, she leaves, she's heading for the house of bread. Now her and her husband head down there. Now I want you to notice that when they go down there, they only went down there to sojourn. That's what it says in verse 1. How many see the word sojourn? They only went down there to sojourn. To sojourn as a temporary residence. And they went down there because obviously they didn't think, uh, they, they thought that what they had wasn't enough. They needed more. They needed something else. But then if you'll drop down to verse 2 at the end of the verse, notice it says, and continued there. And that's usually the way it happens. You don't mean to linger. You don't mean to hang out here. You don't mean to do that. But that's what ends up happening. And I tell you what, the best thing you can do is just stay away from it. And if you find yourself down in Moab, get out as fast as you can. Because when you get in there, there's going to be hurt. Yeah, that's right. I'll give you an example. Uh, Abraham went to sojourn in Egypt. When he went to sojourn in Egypt, the first time the word sojourn shows up in your Bible, you know what happens? He ends up saying that Sarah's not his wife and gets himself into a little bit of trouble. And then he ends up getting out of there. Another fella... The Sodomites said he came into sojourn, and now he's become a judge amongst us. So in other words, it appears to me, by looking at it, everybody knew that Lot's intention was a temporary stay, a temporary visit. But he didn't just stay there temporarily. And the longer you stay there, the more of an effect it's going to have on you. And then you're going to be like Naomi when you realize what you actually did have. That's why she says, that's why she says, I went out full. Because she realized true riches. Some of you don't realize true riches. We got that King James Bible, amen? Are you reading it? Don't let it be taken away from us before we realize what we have. Don't let it be taken away from us. And then all of a sudden they say, you can't have that Bible. And then we're trying to cram to memorize scripture. Don't let it be then. It's a time, about time you recognize what the Lord has given you and quit making all your decisions based on fleshly desires. 
So here it was. It was the sorrow of a bitter loss. So there was a search for a better life. She comes back, the sorrow from a bitter loss, but then notice the salvage from a broken line. The salvage from a broken line. So here I want to give you some, some good news here. Uh, maybe you're saying, man, I went down uh, to Moab. There I, I went down there and I got hurt and I came out of this thing. I'm like Naomi. I'm that hurt creature. And I've come back. Well, I want to let you know that we know that the Bible says and all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. You know that the Lord can take poop and make pudding. <laughs> the Lord can take a mess and make something great out of it. The Lord can take whatever small thing you have and He can turn it into something great. And if you've got a broken life, the Lord can still take whatever you have and He can still do something with it. I mean, here we've got, here we've got a woman that went down to sojourn there in Moab. But do you know that when she went down, do you know what came out of Moab with her? Ruth. You wouldn't have the book of Ruth. How would we have the book of Ruth? I'm not justifying her going down there. But what I'm saying is the Lord was able to use it. Amen. The Lord's able to take some of you that had a drug addict life. He's able to take you that were drunks. He's able to take you that got messed up in false doctrine. And now you're out of it. And he's able to salvage something. Amen. Notice what is, notice here. You've got Orpah. Orpah goes back, but Ruth. Verse 16, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. You know what happens at it? Ruth ends up coming, and now Naomi's God is her God. She goes with her. You know, some of you had a broken life. Now you're, the Lord cleans you up, puts you in a new family. Maybe some of those folks in the past life, maybe the Lord let you lead across, come across some of them and end up leading some of them to Christ. I don't know what the Lord can do with your life, but I know this, the Lord can salvage something. Don't get this mindset, and I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Maybe it's just me and my ministry, but I've seen people over and over and over again start to get, well, you, I, I just have such a, a past preacher. God, God couldn't use me. I, he can't use me. Look, if God can use Balaam's donkey, he can use any of us. If he can reach over and pull a tail feather on a rooster so it crows, he can use one of us. If the Lord can go ahead and have a fish grab a coin so Peter can get it, he can use us. All right, now let's move on. So notice, uh, notice now we have a, uh, a hurt creature. And now I'd like to talk about a helpful companion. A helpful companion, and this is Ruth. So in Ruth chapter 2, it says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Well, I'm sure you know I'm going to use that word hap right there. So the first thing I'd like to point out is notice that she's guided by God. It says her hap, her hap, uh, like uh, happenstance, or uh, somebody said, I think it was Dr. Ruckman said, uh, our, our, uh, our, hap our, our happenstance is, God, ooh, is God's happenings. So what we, uh, what we just think is a chance, the Lord gets in on it. And the Lord's able to use that. Things that you don't think are significant, or things that you don't think are of any great importance, the Lord's able to use those things. Uh, the Lord's able to use just the daily walk in life. He, that's, that's where he's going to get you. Uh, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Remember that? <laughs> All right, so her chance, her chance, she's guided by God. So I'd like you to notice here that what Ruth does is Ruth tells her mother-in-law in verse 2, she tells her what she's going to do. She tells her her plans. And then in verse 3, she enacts her plans. So in verse 2, she says, this is what I'm going to do. But in verse 3, she does it. Don't get to the point where all you're doing is saying what you're going to do. I'm going to go soul winning one day, preacher. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to memorize all the books in the Bible so I can say them in order. I'm going to read through my Bible one day. I'm going to... Don't... Just do it. Come on, yeah. 
Just go do it. Amen. We have a problem in this country. It's a four-letter word, and uh, I hope this doesn't offend you. It's a four-letter word. It's called work. <laughs> People don't like to do that nowadays. They don't want to work. They want everything handed to them. Can I say this? You don't just build a ministry on YouTube because you didn't work. When, and, and, and look, by the way, that's, you guys know that wasn't his like, main goal, YouTube ministry, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> thank God the YouTube ministry happened, but he went building a church, <laughs> and thank God the Lord used it. Oh, and by the way, can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? You know what the Lord's done? The Lord used one guy's work to be a blessing to a whole bunch of other churches' work. I got a bunch of people in my church that came from that. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. You know what it's going to take, though? It's going to take work. I'll tell you what didn't happen. What didn't happen is, is, uh, is Dr. Walker did not get up here, open his Bible for the first time, and say, okay, Lord, download. Give me something. That did not happen. He had to work, he had to sweat, he had to pray, he had to think. It takes work. God doesn't need lazy Christians. You want to be a preacher, you better learn to work. I mean like go to work and work for somebody else. Like show up there and do a good job. Even if everybody else is not working hard, you work hard. You know why? Because God's watching. And God wants to know if you're going to work hard when everybody else won't. You know why? Because there's going to be times in the ministry where no one's going to show up. No one's going to go witnessing. No one's going to go street preaching. No one's going to be there, and you got to be there. Be faithful. Be faithful. Some of you just think all of a sudden the ministry just happens. It doesn't just happen. What did the Apostle Paul say? The Bible says that the Lord uh, enabled him because he counted him faithful, putting him into the ministry. God guided him. God guided her. You know why he guided her? Guided her because she she needed something. And so she said, well, I know what I need. I need, I need some food. So I think I'm just going to go find a place and, and, uh, and go glean some stuff. So I'll just, I'll just go. So she starts walking out and going. She, she knew what the next thing was. She knew what the next step was. She knew what she needed, and it was only one thing. She just, I just need this next step. That's a lot of times how God's going to direct you. Right. It's just going to be the next step. You knew what the next steps were this morning. Did you do them? You knew what you were supposed to do to prepare your heart for the day, right? Uh, You know what you need to do every single day. You say, man, this stuff is boring. It's routine. We heard a whole message. I mean, the preacher was giving us all sorts of stuff on routine. Consistency, just just every single day, just doing it. I don't know if I'm quoting Dr. Kim wrong on this, but just say amen because I think it's a good quote. and I I think it's your quote. He said this. He said, uh, he said, uh, Major on the milk and the meat will come. Did you say that? Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know what that is? That's just the basics. Just doing the little things. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Take that step. But Lord, what's that step? Don't worry about that step. Take that step. I guarantee you, if we knew what 20 years of ministry would do, <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten in. <laughs> I'd have found something else. <laughs> Man, you know the Lord, you know, why, you know why I think the Lord does that? I think he's just being merciful to you. <laughs> you can't handle all those steps. So you know what you got to learn to do? You just got to learn to take the next step by faith. And that's all it is. Just, okay, Lord, I'm, a, I'm supposed to read my Bible? Okay, I'm going to read my Bible. And I'm going to do that every day. I'm just going to do it. I'm supposed to pray? Okay, I'm going to get better at it. I'm supposed to witness, all right, (laughs) okay. I'm supposed to go to church every time the doors are open? Okay, I'll do it. (laughs) Guided by God. The Lord will will direct you. If, if you If you won't do what he's already told you to do, why should he give you something else? All right, notice she's guarded by grace, guarded by grace. So here Ruth is out, and she's doing God's welfare program. God doesn't have a welfare program like we do. Uh... Uh, and and, and uh, our welfare program is this, is basically we just kind of give, 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 and, and don't expect anything. What the Lord did is the Lord just said, uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do. You, you, uh, you cut your fields, uh, don't get in the corners, and don't go over it twice. And then the poor people can come and pick up. They can glean. So if you need something, just go out there and get it. And so that was God's welfare program for the poor people. They would go out there and they would do it. 
Well, here's Ruth, and she looks different than all the other women. She's a Moabite. And so she's going out there in the field, and I imagine she's turning heads. And people are kind of looking at her. And you know that a woman in a different land where people don't know her, she could possibly be in some type of danger. But yet she knows she's just supposed to do this. And so she's going to go and she's going to do that. But you know what the Lord does? The Lord guards her. She's guarded by grace. She's guarded by grace. All of a sudden, out comes this man out there to the field. When he walks out there to the field, he's coming, checking out over everything. And he goes... that <laughs> oh that's uh that's, and they've told the story you know and he goes you don't let anyone touch her Amen. <laughs> notice in verse t- in verse uh verse uh eight then said boaz unto ruth hearest thou not my daughter go not to glean in another field neither go from hence but abide here fast by my maidens let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap and go thou after them, have not I charged the young man that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? She's guarded by grace. Here's Boaz. Boaz calls Ruth over and says, Now, Ruth, I want to tell you something. I, you, this, you picked a good field. This is the right, this is my field. You stay here in my field. And, uh, and I, what I want you to do is anytime, you don't worry about nothing. I told the young men not to touch you. Uh, and trust me, I, I t- they can't do anything without me giving them permission. No one's going to touch you. You just, you just keep your eyes on the work and you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Oh, by the way, if you're thirsty, you just go up there to the vessel and you just draw out. The water is always there. It's never going to run out. <laughs> Up in heaven, Jesus Christ comes along. Who is that? Hey, come here. You say only the elect? Well, sure, if they chose, then they can be elect. He <laughs> said, so listen here, church. You just keep your eyes on the field. Oh, but master, you don't understand. We've got to deal with so much. We've got critical race theory and Black Lives Matter and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. What do we do? Just keep your eyes on the field. You see, nobody's going to touch you unless I give them permission. And so I want you to work. And I want you to give it your all. And if you happen to get thirsty, anytime, maybe in the month of June, you just go get in your vehicle and you drive on, <laughs> you drive on up there to a mountain. And I've got some of my servants up there and, and they've been to the well. And they've taken and they've opened up that book and you just drink nice and deep. Oh, and by the way, if you get down there away from camp and you say, man, I'm thirsty. Well, on Sundays and on Wednesdays, I've got a place where you can go and you can drink some water. And if you happen to get thirsty in between, you just grab that book and open the door and I'll come in and sup with you. She's guarded by grace. Notice she gleaned with grit. She gleaned with grit. So she gets out there and in verse 14 it says, And Boaz said unto her at mealtime, "Mm, Come thou hither. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) At mealtime, come thou hither and eat the bread and dip thy morsel in vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and, uh, and he reached her parched corn and she did eat and was sufficed and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let uh, fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field, notice it says, until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, 
And it was about an ephah of barley. So the last thing I want to say about Ruth is that she, uh, she gleaned with grit. She gleaned with grit. You know, uh, she goes up at meal time, she eats, but then she's got to go back and she's got to do some work and getting out there and she's gleaning and uh, picking, gleaning is just picking up the stuff off the ground. She's picking that stuff up and, and, uh, and every once in a while they would drop some handfuls of purpose. So they would accidentally on purpose drop stuff, you know. <laughs> they, oh, here you go, you know, drop it for Ruth. And, and then she oh, come along, she'd, she'd, she'd pick that stuff up. And she had to do it until even. She had to do it until even. Now, if any of you guys have worked outside, uh, you know, especially in the summer months, it can be rather hot. And a lot of people, the reason why, uh, pe people don't like anything that's challenging. They don't want anything that puts them out of their comfort zone. They don't want to have anything that stresses them out. Uh, but I want to tell you something. That a lot of uh, work is it's stress. It's, 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 it's hard, and, and you've got to just endure it, and you, you have to push through. Over time, you get better and better, and you learn shortcuts, but sometimes there is no shortcut. You just got to work. There's no shortcut to learn in the Bible. You just got to get in there, and you just got to learn it. There's no shortcut to learn it. And so she gleaned with grit. She just dug deep and just went after it. She just had some grit to her and just, and just went and did it. And, uh, and I want to tell you that for you, it's going to be the same way. You're going to be working for the Lord, and you're going to get tired. Some of you already know people who are no longer in the ministry because it just wore them out. It, they just, it just, they, they just, they're just tired. They're done. They're, I'm, I, I give up. It's going to get worse. Well, dig deep, man. Get some grit. You remember that Jesus Christ went a little further. Remember that. So go, go one more day. Just finish today. And then wake up tomorrow and then get some of the mercies that are new every morning. Amen. Say, God, give me some mercy and grace to go through this day Amen. and do the next day. Amen. And when you can barely make it through that and you lay your head on your pillow, you say, Lord, I'm glad today's over. I'm done for today. And then fall asleep. <laughs> and then wake up the next day and go again Amen. and go again Amen. and go again Amen. and again and again. And you know what you'll find? You'll find you're there and you're like, man, Lord, I'm, I just, I'm studying. I'm, I'm trying really hard and, I, and I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And I'm knocking on doors. Nobody's answering. And I'm going to church. And I'm not getting everything. And I'm, Lord, I, I just, I feel like I'm just going through the most. I'm going to keep going. I'm trying. I'm trying to keep my heart right. And then all of a sudden you're going to go along and the Lord's going to go. And it's right here. He dropped it. And you're right here. <laughs> That's why you can't quit. Yeah. yeah. Lord, I just, I can't find some. Ooh. Look what I found. Praise God. <laughs> now I want to introduce the next character, and that is a heroic champion. A heroic champion. Now this is going to be Boaz. And if you will please look at chapter 3 and verse 10. So I'll explain really quick uh, what's uh, happening here. So uh, uh, Ruth uh, uh, and Naomi tells Ruth that uh, the place that she went to, it was amazing that she went to that place because uh, Boaz is a near kinsman. Uh, to her. What that means is in Israel, if uh, a, a man was married uh, to a woman and he died, then someone in the bloodline, like the brother or whoever's the next in line as a kinsman, had to take her to wife so that way they could raise up seed to the dead. And, uh, and so she, uh, Naomi's all excited. She's like, wow, this is fantastic. You need to marry this fella. And so she goes ahead and, and Ruth goes and uh, nothing bad happens here. But notice what Boaz says in verse 10. Of, of Ruth chapter 3, and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, insomuch as thou followest not young men, whether rich or poor. So here she is, she comes, and basically uh, Ruth lets Boaz know that, hey, I want to be married to you. I want to be your wife. And so Boaz is very pleased with that, and he tells her, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. So I want to talk here about this, uh, about this heroic champion here. The first thing I want to point out is that there is a kind pursuit. A kind pursuit. There's nothing promiscuous that happens between Ruth and Boaz. It's not like Hollywood wants you to think something is. Hollywood has the wrong idea. Uh, you know what? In relationships uh, between men and women, that's the right relationships, by the way. Between men and women. That is correct. And by the way, it's only between men and women. There's, 
It's not any, like, they're, like the others don't, like they're, like they're in fantasy land. Is whether, they're, woo. So, 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 but, but, uh, but, but uh, a relationship between a man and a woman is right. As a matter, matter of fact, the Bible says that marriage is honorable in all. Hey. Marriage is right. Marriage is good. It's a good thing, and thank yeah. God for it. And you know what this was here? This, this, is, a, this, is, a good, this is a good pursuit that, he's, that he has here. Uh, what it is, it's a kind pursuit. He's, he is winning her heart over, and, the, it, and it's clean, and it's pure. You know what we need today amongst our Christian people? We need purity. We need cleanliness. Quit getting your morals from Hollywood. Quit getting your morals from the internet. Quit getting your morals from what they say and your friends and things. Get your morals from the Word of God. Because what they don't tell you is all they show you is the pleasure side, but what they don't show you is the pain. There's a lot of pain in all that stuff. You ever read David and Bathsheba? David and Bathsheba, they only show the first part on the screen. You say, have you seen it, preacher? No, but I can guess that's all they show. That's all they show of it, but they don't show the pain. They don't show four sheep for a sheep. They don't show that kind of stuff. All right, it's a kind pursuit. It's a kind pursuit. You know, Boaz, in our, in our uh, uh, Bible here, in our text, is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus Christ did? He pursued after us, and it was a kind pursuit. Some of you in here, you were jerks to the Lord. Let's just face it. You were a jerk. <laughs> I mean, he showed his love for you. He bore his arms, and he said, I love you, and I want to save you. And you know what you did? You just snubbed him, and you pushed him away. And you kept pushing him away. But you know what he did? He's kind. God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love with he loved us, sent Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross for my sin and yours. Ain't that a blessing? <laughs> It was a kind pursuit. You know what else there was? There was a keen plan. A keen plan. So notice in chapter 4, chapter 4 and verse 4. And I thought, uh, so what happens is, is Boaz thinks about it, and he sends, he sends Ruth home, and he thinks about it, and he says, Now, now um, don't you worry, Ruth. Uh, I, I want to marry you, but there is another fella that is closer in line to marrying you than I am. He is the nearer kinsman than me. So I have to give him uh, first dibs. And so he says, but don't worry, I got a plan. And so in chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, and I thought to, so I, I keep jumping ahead of myself here. So let's start in verse 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi. That is, come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it for, uh, before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Notice a keen plan. So here's Boaz, and Boaz comes along, and he sits in the gate, and he's sitting here in the gate like this, and he takes a couple of about ten fellas, and he says, come on, hurry, guys, we've got a business deal we're going to do. All of a sudden, he sees that kinsman walk by, and he says, ho, such a one. Hey, come on over here. Hey, come here real quick. i got something I want to talk to you about. Come sit down. How you doing, buddy? Oh, man, you're looking handsome today, I tell you. I, yeah, yeah. You know what? Uh, you know, it's been a while since we talked, and, uh, you, know, you know, something came to my attention. I, did, did you... Do you know, you remember Naomi, right? Oh, yeah, I remember Naomi. Hey, did you know that one of her boys had a field and nobody can, I mean, the field is up for grabs uh, and can be purchased? As a matter, it should be, your, you should purchase the field. Uh, and, and, you know, if you don't want it, I, I'll, I'll buy it. It's, it's not a big deal. But see, you're closer than I am. And so you can, you can buy the field if you want it. And the guy over here, he goes, oh, yeah, man. Oh, wow, property is really going up right now. Oh, totally. <laughs> I will, I'll totally buy the field. Boaz says, man, that is, that, I knew you would. That's great. Oh, you know what? I, I, you know, it totally slipped my mind. I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot something. Um, you know, when you buy the field of Naomi, you also got to buy it of Ruth and, and you, you got to marry her. <laughs> sorry, it just slipped my mind. And the guy's over here and he goes, uh, oh, oh, uh, breeze there a man with soul so tough who says one wife is not enough. Uh, <laughs> You know what? I already got a wife. Uh, I, why don't you marry her? And Boaz says, oh, I hadn't even thought about it. Thank you so much. I think I will. <laughs> Notice he has a keen plan. He has a keen plan. 
You know he went through all that stuff. He set it up just right. Uh, he was ready to go on that thing. He was ready. You know, the type here is this, and I'm sure you guys already know it. Is the type here is Boaz is a type of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and you've got Ruth, who is a type of the church. And uh, this nearer kinsman, the one that's closer, is God the Father. Uh, but God the Father already has a wife. And his wife is Israel. And so he's not going to marry the church. And so he says, uh, why, don't you, why don't you take her, son? <laughs> and uh, son looks at the father and says, you know what, father? I think I'll die. I'll not only buy the field, but I'll buy her too. <laughs> I'll buy them both. <laughs> So I want you to notice a completed purchase in verse 10. In verse 10, it says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead. So he explains to these guys the business deal that just took place. And he says here, uh, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren. And from the gate of his place, ye are witnesses this day. Now, one of the things that the guy had to do is he had to pluck off his shoe, right? Verse 7, because verse 8 says, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee, so he drew off his shoe. And then verse 11, it says, And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses, the Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, to build, uh, which two uh, did build the house of Israel, and uh, do, thou famous, uh, do thou worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. All right, so uh, in, the, in the contract there, he had to take off his shoe. I'm not going to take off my shoe. <laughs> All right, but he had to take off his shoe. And if I, I used to think it was Boaz that had to take off his shoe, but then my wife said, I don't think it's Boaz. I think it's, uh, it's just getting too hot in here, brother. <laughs> and he said, I don't think it's Boaz. I, I, I think it's the actual, the other fella. Are we good, brother? Do we need a, it's not a, like a bad thing, right? It's good? Okay. All right, so he says, it's not, uh, so, so, she, so she pointed out, she said, I think it's the other fellow, the other kinsman that took off his shoe. Because if you go over to the other passage, when a man was supposed to raise up seed to the brother, if he didn't want to raise up seed to the brother, they bring him before the judges, ask him, do you want to raise up seed? And he would say, uh, no, I don't want to. And they would lose his shoe. And then spit in his face. And, and all the type fits because God said... Uh, Moab is my wash pot over Edom. Have I cast off my shoe? So the Lord, the Lord says, uh, no, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take her. I'm not going to take her. Uh, but you can have her. And, and guess what? When the purchase was done, it was done. It was a completed purchase. Now, now the shoe came off, but the purchase still had to happen. Boaz had to shell out. The purchase, he bought the field. The shoe comes off, the kinsman takes off his shoe, Boaz still has to purchase. The Lord takes and kicks off his shoe. I gotta be honest, I'm not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Like, what, what does that mean? I'm gonna, hopefully you guys know. I don't know. But he, does, he's, he kicks off his shoe. I'm not gonna marry this girl. But a purchase still had to happen. And I know our purchase price. Our purchase price says over in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, to take heed to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God the Father looks at God the Son and says, you want her? Yeah, I want her. Well, I'm not going to take her. If you want her, you can have her. All right, I'll have her. All right, well, you know it's going to be a hefty price. I know it's going to be a hefty price, Father, but I'm willing to pay it. You know it's going to be rough. You know it's going to be blood. It's going to be hard. You're going to go down there and you're going to have to endure the cross, despise the shame. And he said, Father, I'll go. He said, Father, is there any other way to do it? No, son, there's no other way to do it. Then, Father, I'll go, and I'll go because I love her. And off Jesus Christ stepped off of the pedestal of heaven, came down and curled himself in a garment of flesh, and went to Calvary and shed every drop of that sinless blood and paid the price for you and I. It was a completed purchase. When he died on the cross, he lifted up his voice and he said, It is finished. Nothing else to add to it. The last thing I want to tell you is notice a happy conclusion. A happy conclusion. When we picked up our first hurt creature, Naomi, in the very beginning, we found out that she had a, it was rough and she came back bitter. Now we come all the way to the end of the book of Ruth. 
At the end of the book of Ruth, there's a grandson that's born. And here's what we have in uh, notice verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the, woman said unto Na- and the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. So the first thing they say about her, she's blessed. Verse 15, And he, said unto, and, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. There's three things they say about this woman, Naomi. They say she's blessed, she says she's restored, and they say she's nourished. Those three things they say about her. Blessed in verse 14, restorer in verse 15, and also nourisher in verse 15. So I put it down as blessed, restored, and nourished. These are the three things I want to point out here, how the story ends. You know, um, here you've got Naomi at the very end of this story, and when she comes back, she's very bitter. And I imagine that something inside of Naomi just is uh, just not there anymore. She didn't have that sparkle in her eye like she used to have. She's an older woman now, and she comes back. And one of the things that uh, an older woman that can really get to the heart of, a, of pretty much any woman, but especially an older woman, is a grandkid. <laughs> and the Lord knew exactly what she needed. And the Lord said, you know what? You've lost your joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You don't have it anymore like you used to have it. You used to have that joy. Remember when you used to come here and you used to sing and some of you used to like, I mean, I like it that we march around. I enjoy that and I enjoy throwing the hymn books and I enjoy I enjoy that. But remember when it was like down in here? That's what I'm talking about. Remember when you used to get alone with God and you read your own Bible by yourself and it would be just rich? Remember those things? But now somewhere along the way you've lost it. You've lost it. Well, I want to tell you, the Lord knows exactly what you need. He knew exactly what Naomi needed, and he gave her what she needed. What she needed was that grandkid. The Lord gave it to her. Gave her exactly what she needed when she needed it. Couldn't you see uh, Naomi? All of a sudden, here she comes in, and there's, there's Ruth. And Ruth's like, oh, Mom, I just need some rest. Don't you worry about it, honey. I got, I got him. I, you just go ahead, and you take a nap. I got him. And she takes that little baby out there. She goes, look, at, look at, this, is my, this is my grandbaby. This is my grandbaby. Oh, can I hold your grandbaby? Have you washed your hands? <laughs> I mean, you know she had a whole new outlook on life. You know, there is, uh, and, and uh, you could ask Doc about this stuff. Uh, he'll know all this stuff because he's, like, really super smart. But you know, like, like in the uh, psychiatrist and all that, how a lot of times your, your moods can affect you, like, physically. Uh, yeah. Like, it has, and I don't know. I'm just trying to sound smart. <laughs> but it has, like, some physiological changes to you. And, and, and some of you notice that about yourself. You notice that about yourself. You know what? Uh, the Lord gave me this, and I'm praying it in my prayers. The Bible says about Jesus Christ, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. As Jesus Christ prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His countenance is his face. His face changed as he prayed. You know why people's faces are not changing? You know why all you see on it is anger? All you see on it is hatred? All you see on it is lack of joy and depression? Because they don't pray anymore. They don't go to the Lord and ask Him for anything. They don't seek Him. Maybe it's time to pray. And as He prayed, the fashion of His countenance was altered. Now you want your joy. You want your joy. I want my joy. And I tell you what, there's joy to be found. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's just, uh, it's just it's a something in your life, a sin. You've got to get it right. Get it right. You can't have joy if there's sin there. Uh, maybe some of you, you've been, you're kind of doing this. You're, you're dabbling. You know, you're dabbling with Christianity. Well, don't. Jump in. Yeah, like, go yeah. a- like, go after it with your whole heart. Yes. Not because you're told to do it, just because you want to do it. Yeah, that's good. And you might find that that happiness starts to creep in. Like our brother was singing uh, here, happiness is the Lord. Yes. Blessed, restored, restored. Notice she says the restore of thy life. So I'm not, I'm not really, uh, this is not deep, okay? But, but I thought, okay, life, what's the opposite of life? Well, death. Okay, restore of thy life. Well, she wasn't like in the ground dead, but maybe she was like dead inside. And some people can get like that. They like, they like feel nothing. They're just like dead. Wow, like good. nothing stirs them up, you know, anymore. Yes. I've, been, I've, uh, I've, I've been up in my church and I have preached and there are times when, man, it's just the Holy Spirit's there. It's great, you know, and everybody's like right with me. There are other times where it's not there. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, brother, it's like it takes so much physical effort 
to deliver the message. And I don't know if this is only me, but it's like so much physical effort to deliver the message that by the time the thing's over, I am worn out. I don't want to counsel anybody. I don't want to talk. I just want to go home and eat and sleep. That's literally all I want to do <laughs> because it's just so hard. And I just feel like as time goes on, people are just, there's just something inside like they can't get stirred up. Yeah. Now, a stirring up is, uh, I guess that's like an emotion. And, uh, but people do get stirred up about things, but are you getting stirred up about the right things? Yeah. Now, there is something, and this is going to seem like another rabbit trail, but I have somewhere I'm going with it. Uh, will you take your Bible and go to Matthew 26? Okay, so this is a theory of mine that I'm going to give to you. I don't know if I'm right, but I'm going to do my best to explain why I think this is true. So I'm really, really interested in, uh, in uh, the body, soul, and spirit. I'm really interested, especially the soul and the spirit, like understanding them and like what they are and all the things that are connected to. And uh, I heard uh, it said one time that the soul is the seat of the emotions. And, uh, and I, I, I'm like, okay, I, that sounds really neat. How do, I, how do I know that or is that true? So I was reading along here in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 38. It says, then saith he... Unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. Well, sorrowful, that's an emotion. And he says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. Jesus talking even unto death. So I thought, okay, well, then maybe that's it. Maybe like, uh, like that's the emotion. The soul is somehow attached to your emotions. Go over to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Like I said, this is my theory. Numbers 21. Numbers 21 and verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged. You ever been discouraged? I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that's an emotion. It seems like an emotion. I felt it before. Yes. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel 13. Second Samuel 13 and verse 39. Second Samuel 13, 39. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom. So there's a desire there, a longing. All right, that seems like another emotion to me. And go over to Job 14. This will be almost the last one. Job 14. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you here is that I believe that the soul... It's connected with emotion. Job 14, 22, But his flesh upon him shall have pain, and his soul within him shall mourn. Okay, so that my theory is that when they, the phrase, the soul is the seat of the emotions, is a true statement. And the reason I say that, because I, I think that the emotions are connected somehow to the soul. Yes. The soul's within a man. That's what Job just said. It's inside of you. Some of you have been hurt in an area that we can't see. And you have pain like Naomi did where you're dead on the inside. You're hurting on the inside. And so if you'll take your Bible and go over to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want... He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Oh, my goodness. He restoreth my soul. Some of you are hurting because somebody's hurt you. You hurt yourself. Something's hurting on the inside really bad. And it's a wound that nobody can fix. But God got involved in Naomi's life and was the restorer of her life. Some of you are sitting here and you're like, man, I am hurt. And nobody knows I'm hurt. Some of you are carrying wounds from childhood. Some of you are carrying wounds from recently. But you know what the Lord can do? The Lord can restore your soul. He can restore your soul. He can heal hurt emotions. Now, let me put a caveat on this. I'm not saying that, that uh, you need to keep reliving those emotions. Don't keep doing that. Don't keep on bringing them up. Oh, Brother Walker, you have no idea what Brother Gorski did to me. I was there at a blowout, and what did he do? He came and stayed in my place. And I tell you, every time I see him, that's all I can think about. (laughs) 
There comes a point in time where you got to quit doing this number. I heard Brother Gip mention this one time. He talked about Joseph down in Egypt. Joseph's down there in Egypt, and his brothers had, had hurt him. And, but then years later, after he's Pharaoh, or second in command to Pharaoh, they come to him and they think they, they can't get over it. But he's like, whoa, fellas, God sent me here. Some of you need to realize that even though maybe you had something terrible happen in your life, just like Naomi, the Lord can still use it. Quit focusing so much on that and keep your eyes on the Lord and let him heal the wound. I have, uh, sometimes in the ministry, and maybe you guys have this too, you get in the ministry and all of a sudden you have somebody come up to you and they say, preacher, you don't know what happened to me. And it's the first time you meet him. You're like, oh man, tell me. And they begin to tell you this thing and pour their heart out to you. And when they pour their heart out to you, you're like, oh my goodness, what do we need to do? I mean, you're thinking in your mind like a 12-step program or something. I mean, I can, we do this first, do this first, do this first, do this first. I mean, this guy's in bad way. I, maybe I need to bring him over to my house or something because he has no place to go. And then you find out it was like 25 years ago. Yeah. And it's like, oh. <laughs> you're right. Now, I'm not making light of any of your hurt. But if the Lord can't help you through that, he's not much of a God. I'm not telling you to get over it, but God can help you through it. Some of you know that some of the greatest people you have gotten help from in life are people that you didn't even know their background, and all of a sudden something happened, and the Lord brought them right in your life because they had something horrific happen to them, and the Lord helped them through it. Maybe you can be one of those people. You know what the Lord can do? He can restore your soul. Last of all, and I'm done, notice he nourished. He'll be a nourisher to you. He says, and he shall be unto, them a, uh, unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. After this kid was going to be for her a nourisher of thine old, of thine old age. Uh, I want to tell you something. The Lord can nourish you. To nourish means to, call, uh, to feed to, and cause to grow. And you know what the Lord does? The Lord can feed you. He can cause you to grow. You're up here trying to get some nourishment. You're up here trying to get some food. Why? You want to grow. And the Lord can help you do this. Out of this whole entire thing in the book of Ruth, we have the book of Ruth here. It's a great book. I love the book. It's a great story. It's got real people in it who went through real problems in real lives. And out of all this turmoil and strife and things that happen and what you would think would be the end, out of this whole entire thing, we get a woman who just so happens to be in the lineage of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So imagine what God can do with you if you'll just let him. All right.